Okay, everybody, thank you for your patience. I guess I was uh, muted there for a second. Um, I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today. We've got an amazing session for you with some tips for success and how to manage and thrive through disruption. Obviously, we're going through some really unprecedented times, um, and this has been disruptive in so many different ways. Um, and I'm very fortunate to have two amazing guests with me today. Um, we've been fortunate to have Jim Harris with us um, in the past. For those of you who aren't familiar with Jim, uh, Jim is a Canadian internal and international best-selling author on disruptive innovation. Uh, he's been ranked as one of North America's best keynote uh, business speakers, speaking internationally at more than 50 conferences a year. And one of his most recent books um, on disruptive innovation is called Blindsided, which discusses is how businesses can mitigate the impact they experience from disruption in their market. And obviously, we're going through one of the biggest disruptions we've ever faced before. We're also very fortunate to have uh, one of the co-founders of Eagle, who we partnered with on this session. Um, and Kevin and I, I've known Kevin for a while. Um, if you're not familiar with Kevin's content in his blogs and on his social media, I encourage you to connect with him. He's got some really motivational and uplifting content, uh, and he's going to share some of that with us today. For those of you who are not familiar with Eagle, Eagle is one of Canada's uh, largest and privately owned and operated professional staffing uh, firms specializing in recruiting and placing technology, financing, finance and accounting uh, executive and management consulting professionals in both contract and full-time positions. And they have over 10 offices across Canada. And as I said, Eagle is one of uh, Canada's largest privately owned staffing companies uh, in the country. So we're very fortunate to have both of these guest speakers with us today. Um, the agenda for the today is going to be a brief introduction by myself. I'll try and stay uh, nice and quiet for most of the presentation so we can give our guest speakers lots of time to talk. Uh, Kevin's going to share with us some tips for success, and then he's going to pass it on to Jim, who's going to help you understand how you can thrive through disruption, and then we'll close with some Q&A. Um, so just a little background on these webinars and the sessions. Um, we started putting these on. Um, and who we are is we're an accounting firm who specializes in independent contractors. We've been doing that since 1984. Um, and a lot of our clients came to us with a lot of questions uh, surrounding COVID um, and a lot of the government subsidy programs that we had. And we wanted to be able to provide help and support to them. So one of the things that we did is we launched a Facebook community group um, where we provide answers, links to all the um, uh, uh, live streams from uh, the uh, Prime Minister, as well as great content around all the different government and subsidy programs. And Jim was very kind to be able to come in and join forces with us to share his insights on managing through disruption and innovation. Um, and we wanted to, to bring this content um, to uh, a larger community. And Kevin has got a great uh, community over uh, with his client base in Eagle, uh, as well as all of his followers on social media. And he provides some really amazing content on really staying positive and focused on how we can um, move through this crisis with a positive mindset um, to help us come out of the other side of this further ahead. So I'm really, really grateful to have Kevin join us today. Um, and without further ado, um, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin. And again, thank you, Kevin, for joining us today. I'm really excited to have uh, your insights on some of the keys and tips um, to being successful, which I think uh, these are tips that can help you, whether you're in a crisis or not. These are just practical, practical tips for success that obviously are more important in a pandemic, but they're tips that can help you at any point in your career. Is that fair to say, Kevin? I'd say that's pretty fair to say. Uh, the, the pandemic has certainly uh, taken everybody outside of their comfort zone, which can be uncomfortable for sure. But to be honest with you, the best way to change your life in any way, good or bad, is, is by changing things around you. So if you force yourself out of your own comfort zone, that's how you can grow and move forward. 
And the pandemic has done it for us. So this is actually an interesting time for us to take advantage of some of that. So today, just I wanted to do is talk a little bit about my journey and how this um, working class lad from Liverpool who grew up with a little bit of a chip on his shoulder and not very good at school and all that kind of stuff handed, happened to end up owning and running one of Canada's more successful staffing companies. And I'm going to talk about four areas really today that are, have been critical for me in any success that I've had. And then um, I'm going to tell you all about the meaning of life, which is, um, you know, you've been waiting for that your whole life, I know. <laughs> but we'll get to that. <laughs> so let's start. We're going to talk about attitude. Um, attitude is everything. So pick a good one. That's what Dwayne Dyer said. There's a, there's a ton of great quotes out there about attitude. And really, if I think back to the attitude of that 16-year-old kid in Liverpool who hated school and just wanted to get out and do something, uh, I had a stinky attitude. I, I had a chip on my shoulder. Anything that happened in my life was somebody else's problem. It was the problem of, you know, it was the government or it was the boss or it was my parents or it was somebody else's problem. And, and it takes a while to get past that kind of attitude. But I think if, if I look at who I am today and the journey that's taken me to achieve that, you know, it, you have to, um, you have to make that journey and do it for yourself. But to me, the person with the right attitude today is someone who focuses on the positives, someone who makes things happen, who takes ownership of their life. They don't look to anybody else to, to solve their problems. They know what they have to do. And with the pandemic changing everything about our lives today, I think what we we'll end up with here is the potential for opportunity. What we all need to do is to say, okay, it's, here's our reality today. What can I make of this? What can I do with this opportunity? Um, a pandemic for some people paralyzes them. They forget that they just are totally focused on the problem instead of stepping back and saying, what can I do with it? And for those who are going to succeed, we need to find a way to, to, to step forward. It might be an opportunity that you've been thinking about for a while that you've now got time to focus on. It might be a time to educate yourself in something new that's going to add to your skills. If you're an independent contractor, the, the demand for your skills prior to the pandemic, like the, sh the skill shortages was real. There was true demand and that is going to come back. So when it comes back, are you going to be ready? What are you going to do now to position yourself for that? There's still a lot of people who are working full-time through this. You know, we saw 3 million Canadians lose their jobs between March and April, but there's a lot of people who are still very busy and a lot of contractors very busy. If it's not you, then you just got to position yourself for what's coming. You can spend this time looking at relationships and, and the things that you might be doing to help that. And so I think that, now we can look at the problems or we can look at towards the future. And for me, the attitude that you have to adopt is how do I move forwards? How do I make myself better? How do I invest in myself? How do I invest in my relationships? How do I invest in the opportunities that are going to move me forward? So these slides, I'm going to move to really fast. I'm not going to talk about any of these points, but as I talk through, you'll see I throw up 10 points. Uh, after these sessions, Andrew is going to make all this content available to everybody online, and you can contact me directly if there's anything that you would like to talk about. But let's, we'll move on from attitude. I want to talk about brand. Many of you are independent contractors, so what is your brand? What do you want people to say about you when you're not in the room? What, are, what, what is it that you would like to be known as? So as an independent business owner, you know, what's your website look like? How many companies do you know that do not have a website? So if you're an independent con contractor, think about that. You, you probably should have an on online presence. You definitely you? should have an online presence from a PSB. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, that's perfect. I mean, I, Andrew and I, we both went through this. Uh, I've worked a lot with the industry association and we both dealt with CRA on the PSB issue, the personal services business issue. And it is critical. If you are a, 
an independent contractor that you look like an independent contractor, you act like an independent contractor, you are a business owner. And this is part of it. What is your brand? You want to be a thought leader. So how do you go about doing that? I started my blog in 2006. I have about 2000 entries on it. And the part of that is, is sharing knowledge, share, share, share. And the idea is you become known as somebody who might be able to bring some value. And that's part of, of building a brand. How do you dress? What do you look like? What do you want people to think of when they see you? I think as an independent business owner, I'd want to be seen as professional. I'd want to be seen as trustworthy. I'd want to be seen as somebody who exudes confidence. So this is part of it. We've seen a, a lot during these last three months of Zoom meetings. I'd never been on a Zoom meeting in my life, and I'm sure many of you had never before <laughs> either. But, you know, you see all kinds of stuff. I see people come on Zoom meetings and they look like they just got out of bed and they've still got their pajamas on. Is that the brand that you want to present to the world? So to me, it's kind of like decide what you want the world to see you as and then build that brand. Be a thought leader, invest in yourself, do that kind of stuff. I, I really don't need to tell any of you uh, about the pace of change today. Uh, it is uh, unrelenting. Uh, uh, I was a IBM assembler programmer in uh, 1982 working for Barclays Bank. And the computer I worked for, worked on uh, with an OS1 operating system probably had less, definitely had less power than the iPhone you have in your pocket or the, the Android you have in your pocket. I mean, the world, the change is, is just incredible. Alvin Toffler said that the illiterate of the 21st century won't be those who can't read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. It's just so critical. Uh, I was talking to somebody about um, the cloud just recently, and they're talking now about in that how that has changed just in the last two years. The cloud, when we started Eagle, the cloud was I drove, I flew around the country with a, a, a floppy disk in my pocket. That was my cloud. Today they're talking about serverless as the is the new thing in 2020. It's, it's, it's going so fast. So you have to stay up, you have to keep reading, you have to keep working on these certifications, you've got to invest in yourself. It's the only way to stay current and relevant. And so, you know, study, keep studying. Uh, I have a, this will be available on, on the uh, resources afterwards, but you know, there's so much available information and courses free online some of the greatest universities in the world make their content available to you to so take advantage of that so during a pandemic some of us have a little extra time maybe you're not commuting an hour and a half to work and an hour and a half home every day maybe you could take a bit of that time to use if you haven't spent it tutoring your kids because they can't go to school which is also happening and i understand that so not it's not everybody can do it but if you can Take advantage, invest in yourself, don't get left behind. This has got to be my favorite subject. I could talk about this all day. <laughs> Basically, it's time, time management, um, productivity, personal productivity. How do you make the most of your time? I love Stephen Covey's quote because he talks about don't spend time, invest it. It's the most precious resource we have. You don't get it back once it's gone. So you got to really decide how you use your time. If you think about the most productive people you know, think about people running multi-gazillion dollar companies, uh, people who are running countries, the amount of things that they get done in their 24 hours versus what you do. So versus what I do. I mean, so it's been a, a passion of mine throughout my life to try to figure ways to make the most of my time. The pandemic messed with all of your routines. So now that's great because it gives you a chance to revisit them and decide how you want to spend the time on how, what new routines you want to build, what new habits you want to set up to be able to be as productive as you can. In a new work from home environment, you have a tremendous opportunity to, again, hardly ever have to get in that car at 6.30 in the morning to be able to get to the office for nine 
I mean, it's, this is a tremendous opportunity to, to get as productive as you can. For me, the, the tools that for me have been critical in every job I've had, and I've had to revisit in every role I've ever had, the calendar is just a tremendous tool to use in many ways, the to-do lists, and then it's about priorities. Where it, should you be spending time? Lots of people are busy, but they're not productive. You gotta be spending your time on the things that make sense. Uh, if you can delegate stuff, delegate stuff. Very early on, we decided the most important thing for us in our family was time. So, hey, find somebody who can do the house cleaning. Find somebody who can help out on little things. Doesn't cost a lot of money, but delegate anything you can so you can focus on the things that are important to you. Uh, I'll take a little time to talk about when we started Eagle. So Eagle was formed as we were a, a spin out from what was Anderson Consulting, now Accenture. So I ran a division for them and they decided it was not core to their business. And I, it took me three attempts, but they eventually agreed to sell the assets of the division to me and my partners that we, we got together to buy. And um, they gave us 17 weeks to make this happen. So if anyone's ever started a, a business, it's, it's an interesting process. I'd never been out and raised money before, and I could tell you, I could talk all day about that. Uh, you know, we had to get technology, had to hire the staff, had to transfer all the contracts for the independent contractors, transfer all contracts to the clients, we had to find office space, we had to get a name, we had to get business cards, we had to get paper, we had to get printers, everything you can think of that you have to do to start a business, we had to do in 17 weeks. And if I had not been as organized as, as I am, there's no way you can get that done. So it's, it was at one point, one of, the, one of my partners, actually Steve Yuska, who's one who still works with us, all, all the original guys who, who bought in at the front, front when we started the company are all still with the company. Uh, Steve said to me at one point, Kevin, you look like I expect your dad looks. <laughs> That was several weeks into the process, very little sleep, lots of playing time, lots of stress. You know, and it was, but I got it done and we, we, got, we got the company started. So time management, productivity, critical. It's amazing what you can get done if you get f total focus on what, what needs to be done. Okay, so I'm probably running a bit fast here, but that's okay because we're moving on to now the important stuff. This is... This is the meaning of life. Uh, Oscar Wilde said, to live is the rarest thing in the world. Most people just exist. That is all. Uh, behind his quote, you'll see me on my motorbike. It's an Indian chieftain. Um, uh, so I have multiple passions. I like scotch. I like motorcycles. I played soccer for 30 years. I, 30 years in Ottawa. 50 years total. Uh, I, you know, if you have passions in your life, you find time, you make time for them. You do that. The picture of me on the motorcycle is last year in the Alps. I went on a trip uh, around the Alps for a week with 11 ex New York City cops uh, and me. It was a pretty fun time. Um, but again, it's stuff that you can get really passionate about. You can still see the grin on my face on that motorcycle. I mean, I just love that stuff. So, so life. That's me with my grandson. Again, you find time for the things that you're passionate about, things that you want to do. You make time. And that's what priorities, priorities are all about. It's personal and it's work. If people talk about balancing their life. They talk about, oh, I don't want to work too much. Or I don't want to... You know, I want to spend more time on my personal stuff. The reality is life isn't like that. Life is about life and life it consists of many pieces to it. And so you decide where you want to spend your time and you focus on that and you make that happen. And at the end, that's, that's what is going to be the most important to you. The, the happiest people I know are busy people. They have big jobs, they have big commitments and the big responsibilities and not every day is an easy day, but they make things happen and they get that sense of fulfillment from making things happen. As independent contractors, many of you are leaders in your communities, you're making things happen and doing things. It's not always easy, but 
the fulfillment you get from that is great. It's, that's really what you're looking for. So no, none of this journey is an overnight thing. I think if I have a few more minutes, I, I, I'll just tell you a little bit more about me. So I was one of six kids and I had a brother, Phil. So Phil was my baby brother and uh, we both had similar paths in life. At 16, both of us didn't like school and decided to leave. Both of us went in the Navy. I went in the Royal Navy, Phil went in the Merchant Navy. Uh, uh, when you go in the Navy at 16, 17, it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of people your age and there's a lot of drinking happens and that kind of stuff. We both did that. And that's where we started to diverge. So my, my brother, Phil, the drink took him one way and my career took me a different way. But we could have easily been each other. Uh, I lost my brother uh, in 2005 to the drink. And he was 46 years old. Uh, so we make choices along the way. Uh, I, I know a fair bit about addiction. I've, I've done a lot of research and work with it and given a lot of money to different causes around it. And, and addiction, you can get past. We all have things to deal with in life and you can get past it. Um, but the, the idea is for life, to get what we want out of life, you have to focus, you have to have a plan, you gotta to drive towards it, the plan will change, things will change, you go and you, for, you, you move forward and things happen. Uh, Phil and I just chose different paths and I wish he was here, he's not. But for me, the little, the, the 16 year old, chip on the shoulder guy is the happiest guy you could ever meet today. Uh, I'm, I have a great life. I love what I do. It's not an easy life. You can imagine that, uh, in March when this hit, certainly running a company, as you all know, is not easy. So, uh, but it's okay. We're moving forward and, uh, this is the way it is. So, I just thought I'd share this with you. Uh, this is, that's my uh, take on life. Uh, I love my life and I hope you uh, can all decide which life you wanna have and design it and go for it and make it happen. Give priority to the stuff that you really wanna do and uh, you'll be okay. Well, thanks for sharing, Kevin. I mean, this is, you know, what I love about your content is the the positive focus. And I think, you know, life is going to throw you curveballs. Everybody has different curveballs that they face, uh, different forms of adversity that they all, individual people have their own individual adversity that they face. And we have a choice as to how we confront that adversity. Um, we can either curl up in a ball and hope it passes us by, or we can choose to uh, confront our destiny and make choices to persevere and thrive through adversity. And I think that that's, that's for those of you who are attending, I hope that you have taken the choice that you're going to thrive through this adversity, whether that's by addressing how you're going to take your life with a, a maybe a new work-life balance, uh, or maybe how you're going to take this opportunity to take advantage of courses like the MIT courses that Kevin shared with us and all this free content. I mean, we are very, very fortunate to live in the times that we live in where you know, the amount of education is out there is unlimited. Um, and I feel very fortunate that we can have conferences and seminars and that we can actually continue to work and thrive through crises like this, thanks to technology. And technology certainly has evolved um, and changed so rapidly um, that it's enabled us to be able to adapt and, and, and have a new focus. And I think that's where, Jim, you're going to come in and talk to us a little bit about, you know, how, how things have been disrupted, not just now by COVID, which has maybe accelerated the pace of change, but this is not new stuff, right? You've been talking about disruption for, for a long time um, and, and how people and certain companies are able to take that disruption and catapult them to success. Um, so, Without further ado, Jim, we're, we're looking forward to hear what you have to share. Well, we're going to thank you, Andrew. We're going to have fun. Um, thank you, Kevin, for uh, these wonderful insights. And uh, our outlook on life certainly makes more difference than anything else in how we cope with situations. Um, if anybody wants to reach me afterwards, it's just jim at jimharris.com. 
I'm on LinkedIn. By all means, uh, connect with me there. Your network will instantly grow by 27 million people. And if anybody's tweeting today, it's just at Jim Harris. Uh, this is my favorite COVID cartoon. And it's by a guy called Tom Fishburne. And uh, it's a CEO talking to uh, the executive committee saying, digital transformation is years away. I don't see our company having to change anytime soon. And the wrecking ball of COVID coming at him. Uh, really, I'm going to argue today that the toothpaste is out of the tooth. The genie is out of the bottle. You know, Zoom in December had 10 million daily users and in april it was 300 million so my question is how many companies have seen a 30x growth in customer count during the covid crisis so really this crisis offers huge opportunity as kevin was saying and andrew was saying do you know that the average north american worker spends five work weeks a year 200 hours a year in traffic jams commuting to and from work you know what could we do with that 200 hours of time in toronto we waste 10 billion dollars of time in traffic jams you know what could we do with all that time and covid is teaching us you know, many companies had a policy that didn't allow people to work remotely pre-COVID. Now they've all learned that we can actually be productive. So when we come out of this, I predict things will never go back to the way they were because companies are going to say people can be really productive working two or three days or five days uh, a week from home. And this is going to be profound for contractors. Think about the implications of the COVID crisis. 70 million US households own a second or more car. Um, if I can work from home two or three days a week, my spouse can, why do we need that second car? Which cars are the second largest asset that a family typically owns in North America. So uh, people are gonna drop the second car and they'll uh, use Lyft or Uber if they really have to the cost of a vehicle has been constant if you cost adjust for inflation 2019 dollars for 100 years at 70 cents a mile that once we have autonomous vehicles in 2024 that cost drops down to basically one third the cost of owning a car so who's going to own a car when you can get a remote uh, like an autonomous think about uh, uber or lyft but without any driver at one third the cost. So we're gonna see auto sales fall off a cliff. I predict two major car companies are gonna go bankrupt in the next uh, five years, two major global car companies. So this is bad news for car companies, but great news for uh, mobility as a service, great news for Uber and Lyft. Now think about another set of implications. If uh, people can work two or three days from home for organizations, What's going to happen to that really expensive real estate at King and Bay? You know, corporations are going to say, we can cut our real estate by uh, 40% because 40% of all employees can very easily work from home. We're going to drive millions of dollars directly to the bottom line. And what are the impacts for commercial real estate? What are the impacts for pension fund investing? You know, where do pension funds stick their uh, money, our money, you know, and things we can trust like real estate, you know, blockbuster locations. This is the impact of COVID on retailing. You know, today I checked the price. Uh, Amazon is worth $1.35 trillion today. You can take these other eight retailers, add them together, multiply by three and it's worth less than Amazon. So if you don't think that retailing, e-commerce, online shopping is gonna profoundly change the way our society works, think again. Um, at the end of 2019, e-commerce was 16.3% of all US retail shopping. So let's look at this graph. This graph blows me away. It took 10 years for uh, e-commerce to grow by 11% from 09 at 5.6 to uh, 2019, 10 years later at 16.3. Eight weeks of COVID 
has accelerated e-commerce by as much as a decade of slow, consistent growth. So what COVID is doing is hypercharging, hypercharging digital trends. So companies that have been mobile first, digital first are thriving, and companies that have resisted digital first resisted mobile first, resisted AI first, are being crushed. You know, Amazon had to hire 175,000 people during the COVID crisis. How many companies have had to hire so many people? Uh, and retail, you know, we've seen JCPenney, Pier 1, J. Crew, Neiman Marcus all file for Chapter 11 in the US and in Canada, Reitman's. And in fact, UBS, the uh, Swiss analyst firm predicts that 100,000 US retail uh, operations stores will close because of COVID. Not just right now, but there'll be a constant, like a carry on impact where uh, over the next couple of years, 100,000. So if you're enjoying this, um, you can put questions in the Q&A and we'll come to them, but uh, this is a 2,000 word article I've written on the death of driving and the impact of disruptive innovation. And if you email me, jim at jimharris.com or connect with me on LinkedIn, I'll send you a uh, copy of it. I wanna quickly touch on what is possible and what's impossible. So the rate of change that we're dealing with is accelerating it took you know 68 years for the aviation industry to reach 50 million customers it po took pokemon go 19 days in other words the rate of change is accelerating the delta of the delta is accelerating and as kevin talked about education is all the more important right now if you have spare time take advantage of this COVID crisis. And there are so many free resources that you can uh, take advantage of right now. Uh, here's something that's impossible. If you take the market cap of Ford, add it to General Motors, add it to Fiat Chrysler, take all three of them and triple them, they roughly equal Tesla's market cap today. If you don't think electrification of vehicles is going to change transportation, the $10 trillion transportation industry, think again. These are things that we would have said are impossible five years ago. What is driving all this is more than two dozen exponentially changing price performance laws. And the classic one we all know as IT professionals and contractors is Moore's Law. You know, way back in the 70s, a CPU had 2,000 transistors on it. And today it's 43 billion, 43 billion. And what that practically means is a gigaflop is doing a billion transactions in a single second. And in 1961, a gigaflop cost $153 billion on mainframes. And today it's half a cent. And that is so 2020 a number because it's going down to a quarter a cent next year. And what that means is not only is compute power free, it's at the edge. This is a shot from when Gary Kasparov, the world's chess champion, was beaten by IBM's deep blue supercomputer in 1997. It was a tragedy for Gary. He was like completely caught off guard. But the computer from IBM was a hundred million dollar computer. Do you know my smartphone, which is a thousand dollars, has more raw compute power than IBM's Deep Blue. So I carry a hundred million dollar supercomputer around in my hip pocket at all times. And that's a very important thing because our company's using the supercomputer in every one of their customers and prospective customers' pockets. Because if you're not mobile first, if you're not AI first, if you're not digital first, you're choosing not to use the $100 million supercomputer in my hip pocket or all your customers' hip pockets. Not only are, is computing cheaper, lighter, faster, more versatile with a huge number of applications, millions, it's more accurate, but more importantly, it allows different ways of relating to the customer and different business models. 
So think about uh, Libra has been announced by Facebook. Imagine sending and receiving cryptocurrency becomes as easy as instant messaging on Facebook. Will that threaten banks, credit cards, you know, payment vehicles? Absolutely. So I, I love this saying, a crisis is a terrible thing to wake. To Kevin's point, if you have spare time right now, may aggressively use this, uh, this uh, crisis and free time you have to upskill right now. Um, this is a great example organizationally. You know, when uh, COVID hit, some insurance companies had policies that did not allow for remote signatures to put an insurance policy in place. And those companies saw their new business go to zero while their competitors were hoovering up all the business. So decades of legal and compliance resistance to e-signatures evaporated in a single day. So my question is, was that a legal and compliance issue or was it a perception problem? You know, we talked about, uh, Kevin talked about my attitude and my outlook is absolutely critical. This was an outlook problem. So it's not technology that is really the biggest challenge to organizations. It's mindset, it's training, it's culture, it's how we implement change. So I want to give you a staggering stat. Companies that are mobile centric uh, have an 825% higher valuation on IPO than companies that uh, have no digital and mobile presence. I find this a blow me away fact. 825% higher valuations on IPO. So why? First off, Uber is worth more than every single cab company in North America added together because uh, mobile scales, okay? Secondly, we talked about it already. You're uh, accessing that supercomputer in every single client or prospect's pocket. Location and expert, uh, you know, let's look at expectation and location. The most successful app by revenue, other than a gaming app, is Tinder, because it uses the location of every single user to enable people to connect with people who are close by. In other words, not using a mobile app, you're choosing not to geolocate your prospects and your targets. Uh, companies like OfferUp and LetGo are using this. They're uh, competitors to Craigslist and Kijiji that um, uh, sell, uh, uh, you know, you get to list whatever you want to sell or buy and they uh, geolocate buyers and sellers. So how can we take this technology and apply it? Finally, um, Smartphones for Gen Zs and Millennials serve all their needs. Photos, gaming, texting, sexting, dating, music, videos, maps, weather, buying and research, health and fitness, transport, bike sharing, Uber, Lyft, reading books and magazines, leisure, payments, social, car keys, starting your car, navigation, investing. And by the way, it's a phone too. So if you're not tying in to digital and mobile, you're choosing not to use this Swiss army knife that Gen Zs and millennials use every single day. This is a blow me away graph looking at the rise of Uber and Lyft rides in New York City and the decline of yellow cabs. And uh, it's not just the number of rides, the number of vehicles on the road at any one time there are now four times as many Ubers on the road as there are taxis. Do you know the tax, and this, again, it's not just about tech. Do you know when the taxi industry used to do their shift changes? Four till five o'clock in the afternoon. In other words, they used to do their shift changes so you couldn't get a cab during rush hour trying to get home. In other words, they were not customer oriented. So the problems aren't just about uh, technology, it's about customer focus. We need to have empathy for our customers and their lifestyle. In fact, it's ride sharing that gets the highest rating, not yellow cabs. Now the impact of this has been a medallion is the 
uh, taxi plate that allows you to drive has fallen from $1.1 million back in 2013 to $110,000. And that's a 90% asset reduction. In Toronto, it's 95%. This has been uh, played out city by city all throughout North America. In other words, not being responsive to change, not being responsive to customer focus, not being mobile first has a huge negative impact on the valuation of organizations. And that's why IT contractors are so critical today, bringing value to organizations, helping them transform. So um, I wanna look at a, a couple of last things if you stop people on the street and say, hey, what's innovative? What's innovation? You'll typically get this answer, the iPhone. The iPhone was innovative in 07, not so much today. Uh, Samsung and Huawei are way ahead of uh, Apple. Um, but 75% of the answers will be about a product. Similarly, in organization, 75% of innovation effort is around product. But in, this, in the ecosystem of innovation, product only yields 10% of the value while it gets 75% of the focus. 90% of the value is in these other four areas and we'll only address two of them. We'll start with business model innovation. So uh, we've perfected delivering people from point A to point B with a car and a driver. The product is exactly the same as a taxi cab company. So car and a driver, whether it's Uber or whether it's a taxi. So what are all the cab companies doing? Well, in Toronto, Diamond's spending a quarter million dollars developing their own app. My attitude is good for them. But then so is Bex Taxi and so is every other taxi in Toronto. Now, I don't know about you, but the reason I got my smartphone is to download 19 different Toronto taxi apps and key my data into each one individually with my fat thumbs. Not, they don't get it. I have never downloaded a single taxi app, but I don't just work in Toronto. I'm in Shenzhen and, uh, you know, London, England and LA and San Diego and, uh, you know, Stockholm. You know, I don't think I'm gonna download 19,000 different global taxi apps and key my data into each one of them. They don't get it, that it's like Lord of the Rings. I want one ring to rule them all. And if the 19,000 global taxi cab companies collectively developed a single app, I would download that, call it like, since I'm a brilliant marketer, call it global taxi app. I download that and key my data into it and it would work in every country, every city, any currency and bill me in my Canadian dollar credit card. That would work but it requires the owners of taxi cab companies to think at what I call a meta level. Not at their current level like Bex and Diamond aren't competitors. Uber is the competitor because it's worth more than every taxi cab company in North America. If I think about innovating at the business model level, if I can deliver a person from A to B, bill their app on an app and bill their credit card, could I deliver a burger? Yeah, let's call it Uber Eats, does billions of dollars worth of business. You know, it grew by 89% in April because we're all locked away at home and boom, we want our food from our favorite restaurants. What about manila box, manila envelopes and bankers boxes? If I can deliver people and burgers, could I deliver manila envelopes and bankers boxes? Let's call it Uber Courier. How about Uber Pet? Who really wants to take Buffy to the vet and sit for three hours in the vet's waiting office while people are coughing during the COVID crisis? Uh, you know, not me. So Uber Pet is working in markets. They'll come pick up Buffy, drive Buffy to the vet. Vet calls you, you decide what to do. Yeah, they keep Buffy overnight and Uber Pet picks Buffy up and brings him back home. 
What about Uber weed and Uber liquor? You know, those might be popular in Canada, eh? According to Bob and Doug McKenzie. Like, if I'm innovating at the business model level, I'm continually looking for new value as opposed to just looking at my product. Last, I'll just talk about this, which is business process innovation. It took, back in 1990s, eight weeks if you had a car accident until you got your check in the mail. Lemonade is an insurance company in New York that you can only apply for on your smartphone. And if you have something stolen, you have to file your claim report by smartphone. So you can actually answer all the questions for the claim spot, take a picture of the police report and hit the button submit and your claim will go up into the cloud, run against 18 fraud algorithms and come back down three seconds later and say approved. Lemonade holds the world record for a claim settlement in three seconds. That is what the benefit of putting mobile first and thinking differently, thinking from a business model and a process perspective. It changes everything. So I've really enjoyed being with you today. If you want to get the article, um, do email me, jim at jimharris.com. I want to thank Rachel Stedman, who has been uh, behind the scenes here and doing the marketing for today's uh, webinar. And uh, I just want to say it was an honor and a privilege to be on with Kevin, uh, you know, the founder of one of the largest and most successful staffing agencies in Canada. We certainly are moving more and more to contractors. And I have been a personal client of CPA for IT for more than 20 years and speak very highly of uh, working with them. They uh, work uh, exclusively with contractors and it's made a huge difference to my business for more than two decades. So I'm going to throw it back to you, Andrew, uh, to host our Q and a session. Well, thank you very much, Jim. And, and thank you, Kevin. I, you know, I'm going to start the Q and a question with the, one of my own questions. Um, so I think, and it's actually a question for you, Kevin, you know, Jim talked about all this disruption and, um, and innovation and mobile first and AI, you know, where do you think technology is going from, you know, where do you think contractors could invest their time? Where, where should they spend their time learning? What are going to be the skill sets that are going to be in the most demand post COVID? Uh, well, I mean, all the, the obvious areas, all the studies show, you know, digital, everything digital, like, like Jim talked about any company that hasn't gone digital already is suffered and now they're all scrambling to come back. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, digital, mobile, you know, fintech, AI, uh, computer security, all the hot areas for sure. You know, the, the, the world of the hacker is getting worse and worse and worse. So, you know, that's, that's huge. Um, when you talk about the cloud, anything to do with the cloud is, is, you know, part of the digital transformation yeah. exercise that people have to go through. Um, so, so those are, those are big key areas. We're, we're always being look, asked for project managers. We're always asked for business uh, analysts, people who can talk tech and business, people yeah. who understand. So that's, those, those are two, always been two of the biggest areas of demand for us. So, uh, for, but for me, it's, it's kind of more about um, uh, when a client wants a contractor, they want somebody who's, to hit the ground running. Yeah. So, so often I'll get asked by contractors, well, you know, I want to get, get into this new area. So there's an investment to be made to get from A to B. One way to do that is to get in with a client and take the journey with them. And that may mean, you know, taking a slightly lower rate now so that you build the skills up later. It's, it's not an easy thing for a contractor to move from one skill set to another, but it can be done. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've, seen, I've seen clients do it. And it, like you said, it oftentimes mean, means taking a lower pay rate. It's, it's pretty hard to just go and just get certified in a new program yeah. and then come out and get a job um, in that new skill set just because you've been certified in it, right? Exactly. Uh, so finding that right opportunity where you're going to be given the exposure to a new skill set where you're bringing in some knowledge um, and having that. I think the one thing that I've always seen is, as being something that's really 
tried and true where, where you can always get a benefit is in the soft skills training. Because as you mentioned before, right now, no one's looking for just the best programmer. You've got to be able to be the best programmer and still be able to explain everything you're doing in layman's terms and have those soft skills to balance um, the technical and the soft skills. And, you know, and, and obviously that's something that I don't think will ever go out of style. In fact, if anything, it will become more and more important. hundred yeah. percent. Um, we do have a, a question here in the Q and a note. Um, um, Kevin, you've been uh, answering some of them as we go along. Um, and we've got one from, again, from Don who says, one of the dilemmas about contracting is hitting the ground running, not based on ca capabilities, but on a checklist of experience, which we, we've sort of talked about, you know, we, we heard it sort of hit this question before I read it. Um, so it's really, I guess, about trying to find that right opportunity where you can build experience. Now, I guess one of the questions, how do, how do clients weigh um, experience when people go out and volunteer or, you know, build out their own programs and applications, do they weigh that the same way that they would um, value paid experience? I'm going to assume not. No, that, but again, I think part of it is, is how you present yourself. Yeah. So to me, there's ways to present that experience as being relevant to a client. And if, if you can't sell yourself to a client, so you have to understand what they're looking for and be able to take your skill set and apply it to what they want. That's the, that's the real thing. So that's what we're kind of there to help with. But quite often, you just don't get that opportunity. You know, this, a laundry list comes out from a client with very little understanding of what they're really looking for. Yeah. We're, then we're just trying to do matching and you, you try to, you know. So the real value comes when we can have conversations with clients and really dig into what's going to work then we can have say, oh, well, these, these are the right people for that kind of a job. Yeah, and we, we hear horror stories of clients asking for 10 years in experience of a software that's been around for five, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's very hard to do. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you said there's things that are not possible and things that are possible. Is that well? <laughs> well, maybe, maybe if you worked 80 hour weeks for five years, you'd have 10 years experience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I think that, uh, you know, one thing that's really interesting about the contract world is that um, as I've watched it evolve, you know, as I worked with my, my dad now since, well, dec double digit decades, um, you know, or, or double digits anyways, and de decades, is that it really has evolved from, you know, in the beginning, it was, it was a lot more um, relationship driven where you had those conversations and you understood your contractors as the contractor market has grown and it's become more digitized there is that checklist and that almost that algorithm that you have to beat before you even get that opportunity to meet face to face and prove that you're the guy Do you have any tips on you know how do you structure do you keep multiple resumes for different job types you know, is it almost like, you know, you're, you're optimizing for keywords the way you might optimize for SEO? Does it work that way now? Kind of. I, I, there's all kinds of, I read these articles all the time where you should never have a resume more than a page long or you should never have a resume more than two pages long. There's no one size fits all. Mm -hmm. This is a one-to-one -one world that we work in today. One-to-one, -to -one, whether you're selling, you know, B2C or B2B, it's one-to-one. -one. You gotta, you gotta target what you, the opportunity and, and position yourself for that opportunity. If you are applying to a federal government job and you got a two-page resume, forget it. You know, I've seen fifteen-page resumes for jobs. Really, the federal government, really, absolutely, and wow. they get the job. You have got twenty-five years working experience in, in in the federal government. There will be a whole bunch of projects on there, and they want to see them all. Right. So it's. It's kind of, it's a different world. It wouldn't work if I was to send resumes over to TD Bank. They would say, "What the hell is what's, this? What's that?" Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not so even going to look at it. No, but you got to know your audience. You got to know what they're looking for, and you got to target your resume, your skills, your 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 uh, approach to them. Yeah. So we've got a couple more questions uh, in here. Um, so more of a comment. Toastmaster skills for IT contractors. I love it. I know Kevin's done Toastmasters. I've done Toastmasters. I've done Toastmasters. So we've all done Toastmasters. I think great organization, great way to improve your public speaking. Um, you know, being able to present to a group of people is, is going to become more and more important. Absolutely. Um, uh, if we, 
another question from Don. If we, if we can't get an initial contract, how do we start uh, on the other way is to volunteer for standards development. And I think volunteer can help, but as Kevin said, it's never going to be weighed as much as getting in there and getting a contract. So I think when you can find something where you can, where it's an industry where you have some industry knowledge, but you can branch out into maybe a different broader area to expand your skill set uh, is one way to go. I don't know if you agree on that, Kevin, um, but I think you've got to bring some value to an organization where you've got some maybe industry knowledge and then you can learn some technical skills uh, along the way. As an independent contractor, you got to think of yourself as a business. Mm -hmm. So you got to have a business plan. Yeah. Here's, here's what I bring to the table. What can I do? Where do I want to go? How am I going to get there? What are the skills I need to bring? What are the experience I need to bring? And how am I going to get that? And there's, there's multiple ways. I suggest to every independent contractor, you should have a relationship with three or four agencies and the, the recruiters within them and have conversations with them and build a relationship with them because when they get those jobs, they call the people they know. That's yeah. who. The, that's how it works. It is still relationship driven, right? Yeah. I mean, From the recruiting side, yeah. yeah. Often we don't get to have a, the relationship with the end client that we would like these days. They, yeah. they stick a tool in the middle, or they stick an MSP in the middle, and you get you get given what you get given. Yeah. Uh, we work around that as best we can. Don't tell them, but we do that. <laughs> so so you try to get as much as you can. But the relationship between the recruiter and the, the consultant will always exist yeah. and and you build a relationship with a the recruiter they're gonna they're gonna find the jobs and they work with several of them yeah they're your that's marketing the that's I, right. I, i've always said this to, to clients some clients are you know have always you know we have a, that that group of clients who always question the value of a recruiter i'm like no dude this is it's they are your marketing team there is a benefit to them to making sure that when your contract comes up for renewal, you're either renewed or they've got another contract in place. They are your marketing team and they know you and they, when they have an opportunity, they're going to reach out and connect with you to make sure that you're constantly working because it's a win-win relationship. As long as you're working and on contract, it is truly a win-win symbiotic relationship. Um, now we've got a couple of questions specifically about that. Um, I'm going to start with, with one uh, from Sharifta. If I'm pronouncing that correctly, she said, what would be the best advice that you would give to an individual who is in a perm role right now, but is thinking about transitioning to a life as a contractor, especially during these times? Um, so my advice is make sure you get a good accountant. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm biased on that uh, because one of the hardest things that, that there is um, that you're going to manage differently is it's not just a T4 anymore. You're now a, a entity you have to keep track of revenue you have to keep track of expenses ps for everybody who attends today we're going to be giving you some uh free gift we're going to be giving you a copy of receipt bank which is a mobile phone application that allows you to take a picture of your receipts and it digitizes them ocrs them and turns them into data that you can download into your financial management software um, but that's from a bias perspective i think the question was really probably intended for kevin from a marketing standpoint and a transitioning standpoint, um, you know, is this the right time to make that transition? Um, is there anything that people should be aware of when they make that transition? You're going from being an employee to being a business owner. Yeah. That's the biggest change. Your technical skills are your technical skills. If you have in-demand technical skills, you, you will be an in-demand contractor. Yeah. Uh, that's just the way it is. Uh, if, if, so if you are in demand now as an employee and you're making that change, the biggest thing you do, like I'm going to agree with Andrew, 100%, get yourself an accountant who understands independent contractors. There's lots of accountants out there who don't, honest to God, like they just don't. Um, and then a lawyer yep. and set yourself up as a business, yep. and develop an agent. A, a website, uh, business cards, a plan, set yourself up with a line of credit to make sure that you're able to, to get through those times when you don't actually have a contract and, and understand the implications of, of, uh, of being a business as opposed to being an employee. Yeah. And it's tremendous opportunity. It really is. If you think about some of the largest Canadian success stories, uh, you know, back Cognos was started by a few um, consultants getting together. 
uh, and became the largest Canadian software company. Um, you know, LGS was some, DMR was the same way. There's a whole bunch of very successful Canadian companies that were just a few contractors or a few consultants getting together and starting something up. So that's, that's another reason why you can think about this stuff. Yeah, and, and we, we do see that quite frequently. The logical um, evolution of an independent contractor is they, they, have, they start building a team and they start working not on, you know, as a contractor, but building project-based work and then growing and growing. And we've seen that as a logical evolution. Now, um, we, we do have another question about uh, specifically a rate question here is with web developers, the rate has decreased. Um, should people take what they can get right now or should they negotiate or demand regular rate uh, that was there before the pandemic? Um, this is a, an interesting one. I, I guess it really comes down to how in demand your skill set is. And probably right now, I'd probably lean towards take what you can get, but I don't know what your thinking is on it, Kevin. Um, <laughs> should I buy Apple stock now or should I buy, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's just, where is the market going? Yeah. Right, right now, dollars in your jeans are better than no dollars in your jeans. So I'd say yeah. take, take what you can get, but don't do it with the viewpoint that as soon as the rate goes up, I'm going to dump this contract and go to the next one. But yeah. then you're, you're hurting your brand. You're hurting, you know, your reputation, which is all you have as yeah. a business person. Yeah, it's a so, tough one. So it's, 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 you know, make a commitment. If it's a six-month contract and it's, it's, you know, five bucks an hour less than you really want, commit to the six months. Don't, yeah. 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 Another question here is um, regarding any training on any specific new technologies. Do you see any emerging technologies that you find – growing at accelerated rates that, that might be interesting for people to focus on? Well, the electric motorcycle is um, <laughs> an interesting one. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, obviously, one thing that's really, um, in, in you look in Canada, um, we've got such a big um, community around game development, um, AI, natural language processing. Um, I think, you know, just from where I think technology is going, myself um you know i think you know ai and um natural language processing and machine learning are without a doubt just at the beginning of where we're going with these technologies uh, i don't know if there's any specific languages or specific skill sets um that you'd recommend um i guess you know everyone can brush up on you know um their general skill sets as we talked about about the soft skills but what about the specific technical skills yeah, I couldn't tell you. Yeah, I'm not close enough to be able to say, you know, you gotta You might need Dana to answer that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you might need you might need one of my recruiters to answer that one. Yeah. Sheriff do you wanna answer that one? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we'll 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 tailor that one and we'll we'll put it when we reply back with the um with the uh, slide deck and the copy of the presentation. We'll see if we can come up. Maybe I'll I'll uh, task you, Kevin, see if one of your recruiters can come up with the top ten skill sets. I've got a presentation actually that I could, I could send over, but yeah, yeah, we can, we can do that. Awesome. Um, so I think we've, we've covered um, most of the questions today. And again, we're, we're a little over time. I appreciate uh, Kevin and Jim uh, staying with us longer. Um, thank you guys very much. You know, one of the things we didn't really touch on at all today um, was any of the government uh, programs. Uh, we've got, again, lots of support in our Facebook group. I do encourage everyone uh, to join that Facebook community. Mm. Um, we've got uh, lots of help and support in there. Uh, there have been some recent announcements and some recent changes, which I will let everyone know. Uh, the CERB has been extended by an additional eight weeks um, for anyone who is on that program. Um, there have also been some changes to the SIBA, which is the emergency bank account. Um, they've most recently uh, reduced the uh, criteria. Uh, before, you had to have $20,000 of payroll in 2019. Um, so that has been loosened up and they're opening it up to more people. Um, so there have been changes. If anyone has any specific questions, feel free to um, hit me up. Um, we do have uh, a custom email available for anyone with questions around COVID, which is COVID-19 at cpa4it.ca. Um, we've got the Facebook community and we're here to help you guys in any way that we can. Um, we know it's a stressful time and we want to provide support. Um, and I want to thank Kevin and Jim for 
keeping us motivated and recognizing that we can still have a positive outlook even in these difficult times. So there's always a silver lining, right? And scotch. And scotch. <laughs> Woo! Um, I just mentioned, Andrew, uh, the webinars that uh, you've done in past cover some of the topics you just mentioned. Yeah. So that's a resource for people to go back and look at the programs you outline in detail and qualifications for uh, in the prior video content that should be posted uh, on the sites you just mentioned. Awesome. Okay, thanks, guys. And uh, we'll call it a day for now. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye.